Is that Earth you can see at a distance? Right. Just look at it, floating in space, hanging out with its planet buddies. You spot orange-red Mars and Jupiter with its asteroid belt. Even tiny Pluto is there. All these planets keep their distance from each other, moving along in their own orbits. They're not very social, you see. But that's a good thing. It would cause nothing but trouble if they started to bump into each other. But even though there are others, Earth is the only planet we know that has life. And we've even figured out why. It's because it was lucky enough to appear in the best spot in our solar system, in the Goldilocks zone. Scientists say the key ingredient for life is water. But, well, there's water on Mercury. This planet has deposits of water ice at its south and north poles, but only because those places never see the light. Everywhere else, water simply evaporates from the surface of the planet. Mercury is way too close to the sun. Pluto has some water too. Astronomers even think the dwarf planet might be up to 30% water, but it's frozen. Unlike Mercury, Pluto's too far away from the sun which is why all its water is in the form of ice. But Earth hovers in a perfect spot called the habitable zone. It has the right temperature for the water to remain liquid and for all forms of life to flourish. But what if Earth was the only planet in the solar system? No Mars, no Jupiter, no Mercury, no Venus. Things might have turned out a little different than what we're used to. Remember that massive asteroid that hit the Earth around 66 million years ago? Well, without Jupiter and its asteroid belt, our planet would be constantly hit by meteorites and asteroids. And some of them would be just as big as the one that caused all that sorrow to the dinosaurs. These rocky fellas would be roaming around in space with no one and nothing to stop them. And if Earth was the only planet out there, it would also be their only target. But that's not all. Look at all this huge space Earth would have all to itself. It means our planet would have an opportunity to travel a bit. It could even choose to leave the Goldilocks zone. But then, would life on the planet still be the same? So let's say Earth started drifting away from the sun. Then, it'd soon get too cold on the planet. Picture a place where the sun doesn't shine anymore. Dark, cold, covered in ice and snow all year round. That would be our Earth if it traveled further from the sun. If this happened, our cities would start to look very different. Right now, Earth is full of life. Come to any park and you'll see green trees and grass everywhere. There will be people walking, sitting on the benches, enjoying the sun you'll definitely spot someone playing soccer or frisbee. On the park's lawns, there will be people resting on their blankets, soaking up the sun. A few people will be reading their books, looking relaxed and happy. Back in space, you see Earth again. The planet is still in its favorite spot. That's why life is so beautiful down there. But wait, is it moving? Our planet is definitely further from the sun now. Has it changed things for Earth? It actually looks a bit bluer now. Down there, famous Golden California is not so golden anymore. It's gloomy and dark, much like all other places on Earth. New York is covered in ice. Even in the hottest places, the temperatures are now below freezing, including tropical destinations like the Bahamas. After a while, liquid water turns into ice. The oceans now look like giant skating rinks, Except there's no one to skate there since the planet has become way too cold to support life. Okay, then what if, instead of drifting further away from the sun, Earth moved closer, with people still aboard? Whoa, the temperatures here are crazy, too hot to handle. The climate would be getting hotter and hotter. Natural disasters would start to occur more often. Hurricanes and floods would be a common thing on Earth now. And pretty soon, the planet would get too hot for people to handle. Particles from the sun would become a serious threat. The atmosphere would be struggling to protect Earth from solar radiation. But this shield would be growing weaker. Liquid water would be nowhere to be found anymore. 
maybe only in underground deposits, Earth would look a bit like Mars, all rocky and barren. The Mississippi River would dry up and leave behind a huge canyon. All the oceans would be gone too. At the moment, the Mariana Trench is the deepest known place on Earth. It's incredibly hard to reach its bottom because of the immense water pressure there. But without water, trips to the deepest spot on Earth would be possible. It would help people uncover some more of Earth's secrets. If people still lived on the dry and scorching hot planet, that is. In other words, if someone was to explore Earth after the planet had moved closer to the Sun, everything would be completely different. But what if Earth didn't move at all and everything remained the same? The only difference, there would be no other planets around us. It would change the way people explore space. Sure, there would still be navigation, communication, and weather satellites, and maybe space telescopes. But there wouldn't be any other space objects close enough for people to send missions there. This would affect the future, too. If people had no desire or opportunity to go to space, they would invest in their home planet. They would build sky cities instead of looking for other planets to colonize. These days, if you get a state-of-the-art telescope, you'll see distant stars and other planets. The better the telescope, the more detail there is for you to see. But with no other planets out there, the picture of space wouldn't be so exciting. Stars would still be visible, and you might even spot a meteorite or two. And you'd definitely see the moon, but that's about it. Space agencies would mostly be focused on keeping Earth secure, mainly because asteroids would become frequent visitors. To protect the planet, scientists would have to figure out ways to get rid of them. Like a massive laser beam. When turned on, it could go all the way to the moon and even further. Instead of building rockets to explore space, SpaceX and NASA would be in the asteroid clearing business. People wouldn't even think of trying to contact other civilizations. If there were no planets similar to Earth, they would consider it a wasted effort. This means no radio signals being constantly sent out to space. A curious fact, in February of 2008, the Beatles song Across the Universe was beamed into deep space. It was done to celebrate both the song's 40th anniversary and NASA's 50th anniversary. In the 70s, people also sent a radio signal out into space. It contained some basic information about humans and the solar system. But it was more a feat of strength for technology than an attempt to contact any alien buddies we might have. With no planets around, the world of sci-fi would change too. There would be no more movies about deep space exploration. No massive spaceships and rockets would appear on the big screen. And since there would be no expeditions to other planets, no rovers would be sent to space to look for signs of life and explore new worlds, like what the rovers on Mars are doing right now. People would concentrate more on their own planet. For example, they would begin to explore its insides. New technologies would allow us to dig much, much deeper, all the way through Earth's crust and further. And doesn't a trip to the planet's core sound exciting? Instead of astronauts, there would be explorers of the deep underground. New drilling technologies would be invented to make the digging process more effective. There would be new types of vehicles. They would be created to drill and protect explorers from the enormous underground pressure. While exploring the world under the planet's surface, people would likely find absolutely new life forms. Those would be mysterious creatures that evolved to survive in the dark in extreme temperatures and with barely any food. It certainly helped people understand more about their home planet. Have you ever thought about Earth itself as an intelligent, well, not creature, but maybe an entity? Like it has a mind and some survival instincts of its own. When said like this, it sounds like you're about to watch a fantasy movie where the planet we walk and live our daily lives on will suddenly wake up realize it doesn't like us that much after all, and just go crazy. Hope not. But we're not actually talking about such scenarios. More of the idea that the collective activity of life, like microbes and plants, can change a planet and give it a life of its own. 
It's like the planet has a green mind. The metaphor of Earth as a living planet makes sense. Creatures across the globe crawl, swim, walk, and fly through the uppermost layers of our land, ocean, and sky. Plants cover much of our world. Plus, there are viruses and bacteria in the water, soil, and even atmosphere. Now imagine all the living things on Earth, like plants, animals, and microbes, as a giant team working together. They have different jobs, but they all do their thing to make the planet a better place to live. For example, plants make oxygen that we breathe, and animals help pollinate flowers. Together, they form the biosphere, which is like the Earth's team of life. We're far from that, but it's still nice to imagine. At the moment, our civilization is in the stage scientists named an immature technosphere. That means we're still too focused on using technology that doesn't always do good for our planet. We don't have a planetary intelligence or a collective understanding of what needs to be done to do better for our planet. Instead, we're all just doing our own thing. I mean, we're not at the worst stage. Researchers have come up with four stages of Earth's past and future to explain how planetary intelligence could impact the long-term future of humanity. The first stage is what we call the immature biosphere. It's when life first started on Earth, billions of years ago. Only microbes were there on the bare land without any vegetation. There wasn't any global feedback, which means these microbes couldn't yet affect Earth, its atmosphere, or other systems in any way. The second stage is the mature biosphere, which was 2.5 billion to 540 million years ago, when stable continents formed and the biosphere started to have a strong influence on the Earth. The third stage, known as immature technosphere, is where we are now, with interlinked systems of communication, technology, transportation, electricity, and computers that draw resources from Earth's systems and affect the biosphere. The fourth stage, also known as the mature technosphere, is where Earth should aim to be in the future. It means technology will benefit the entire planet. We'll use sustainable forms of energy, like solar power. Planetary intelligence is the sign of a mature planet, and researchers are trying to figure out how we can move towards it. So things we do on an individual level do matter. The collective activity of life, like microbes or plants, can change a planet and make it more than just a lifeless rock floating in space. Through the biosphere, our home planet kind of figured out how to host life by itself billions of years ago, and it's still going. Now we need to figure out how to have a similar kind of self-maintaining system, but this time with the technosphere. It's hard to imagine planets could generally become sentient, like Pandora, or some other imaginary conscious world out there. There are a few reasons for that. First, planets form based on how different materials like rocks, gases, and liquids gather around a new star. It's like you have a big family gathering, where everyone brings different ingredients to make a delicious dish. And just like how these ingredients won't suddenly turn into a living being, the materials that make up a planet won't just turn into self-aware creatures. On Earth, after billions of years of complex chemical reactions, some molecules started to replicate themselves and carry information. That's how life on our planet began. And Earth is the only such example we have. Here's the second reason. Imagine you have a big garden where you plant a lot of mushrooms or bacteria, hoping they'll become really smart and help you take care of the garden. But mushrooms and bacteria don't have brains like we do. Eh, it's not like they need it anyway. Having a big brain is really expensive for animals too. It takes a lot of energy to keep it running. So animals only become as smart as they need to be to survive and thrive in their environment. Dogs and cats are pretty smart because they need to be able to avoid danger and find food. They don't need human kind of intelligence for things like building houses, creating art, or inventing new technologies. So it would be hard to bring all living beings and plants to the same level of intelligence. The third reason why it would be difficult for a planet to become sentient is the main rule of the animal kingdom. Life is all about survival of the fittest. 
Every creature is competing for resources, like water, food, and space. But not only do different species compete against each other, but individuals within the same species also fight. Just think of how fiddler crabs fight for territory on the beach, or how wolf packs fight over prey. Or me, when I see an empty spot on a crowded beach. This kind of competition is not a good base for global cooperation. There are a couple of exceptions to this rule. For example, ants. They may not be the brightest creatures on the planet, but when they come together in colonies, they can achieve amazing things, like gathering food that's way bigger than them, building nests, raising young, and even farming. In fact, they act like a super organism called a hive mind, where every ant works together towards a common goal. Insects like bees and ants are very altruistic and work together to ensure their queen reproduces. If one large ant colony took over our whole planet, it could act as a single mind and work towards the colony's and planet's interests until they run out of resources. But in reality, it's hard to imagine any organism, even a superorganism, could reach such a level of self-awareness and consciousness. Number 5. How could we keep in contact? When it comes to communication, ants use pheromones and humans use nerves. Both of these methods work well for small organisms, but when it comes to a giant planet-sized entity, it would be hard to make such communication fast and efficient. So, communication within a planet-sized entity would be much slower than what we have in our homes, like our computers or smartphones. Oh well, we'll just continue dreaming about Pandora. It all started with a minor change on our planet. At first, people noticed the moon had become brighter and a little bigger, but nobody paid attention to this. The moon affected tides all over the world. The water flooded the beaches, but it wasn't a tragedy. A lot of fish came close to the shores. People found giant squid, anglerfish, and other creatures next to the coast, although they usually live in the dark depths. New, stranger things happen every day. Birds no longer fly to the south in winter. They gather in huge groups flying around cities with no purpose. The moon used to help them navigate in nature, so they can't figure out which way to fly anymore. In the boundless waters of the world's oceans, ship captains notice that compasses are now unstable. The arrow is pointing in different directions since the Earth's magnetic poles have changed. People realize the moon has started to approach Earth for an unknown reason. The moon's gravity affects the gravity of our planet. This entails changes in the climate, the behavior of all living beings, and the magnetic field. Now, it rains in the driest places and gets hot in the coldest lands. It's knocking down ecosystems all over the planet. People living near forests hear wolves howling all the time. The moon drives these animals mad. The Earth's natural satellite is growing in size and lights up the night much brighter. Nothing critical has happened yet. People don't panic because they don't want to believe the end is coming. But then, one day, the moon reaches a critical point. You're walking down the street listening to music. And at that moment, someone pushes you. Okay, maybe that guy is late for work. You keep walking and a girl coming by hits your shoulder. I'm sorry, she says, and goes away. You've noticed the fear in her eyes. You look ahead and see people running towards you. You take off your headphones and hear screams and sirens. People leave their cars and run away. Hundreds of seagulls are flying in the sky. You hear a strange noise among all the sounds of chaos. It seems to be water. How is this possible? You're in the city center, a few miles from the shore. But there's no time to think. You notice a huge wave flooding the streets and heading straight to you. You run into a building and go up to the 10th floor. From here, you're watching the water filling the city. The strong stream blows all cars, one-story buildings, and trees off the road. You notice a shark and other fish in the water. People are hiding in houses and on the roofs. The whole city is quickly plunging into a catastrophe. The TV is working in the building where you're hiding. You learn that floods are occurring all over the world. Massive tsunamis cover coastal cities. In some places, 
waves reach the height of a 30-story building. Many towns have been washed off the face of the Earth. The moon is too close to Earth, and massive floods are just the beginning. The moon flies around Earth and helps to keep our home on its axis. The moon provides climate stability and helps living organisms develop. But now, this balance is broken. The moon is approaching and changing our planet's gravity. Earth can tilt slightly to the side and provoke massive floods around the world. Imagine that you're holding a round glass of water. Tilt it a little. See how the liquid moves from one side to another? The same thing is happening now with the oceans. But the moon is not just approaching us. It's flying around the planet and getting closer with each circle. It causes natural disasters in different locations on Earth all the time. Now the ocean floods one side, and a few hours later, another. So you see all the water going back from the streets to the shore. The oceans may return to the city again by the end of the day. Wait a minute. It seems the end of the day has already come. You notice that the sky has become dark. It's weird, because it's only 3 p.m. The moon changes Earth's rotation speed and makes the day go faster. The moon covers almost the entire sky and brightly illuminates our planet. You see huge lunar craters. It's so close that you can still see it even when the sun shines. In some places, the passing moon obscures the sun. The water is leaving the streets and everyone goes outside. At this moment, an earthquake begins. The road is cracking and the houses are collapsing. There are landslides on the street. Tectonic plates are shifting all over the planet. Imagine two magnetic balls that are approaching each other. So, one ball is the moon and the second one is Earth's core. What do you think will happen to what's above the core? That's hundreds of thousands of miles of the Earth's crust. And now, it's all moving. Destructive cracks are emerging all over the world. The planet's highest mountains break down and turn into a pile of stones. The seabed cracks and releases magma from the underground depths. Volcanoes wake up and erupt magma. Clouds of volcanic ash cover the sky from the sun and the glowing moon. But the scariest thing is still ahead. A collision is inevitable. The moon flies around the planet like a ball in a round glass with a hole in the center. This force drives clouds all over the planet. Now there's a thunderstorm, but in five minutes, it will be snowing. Then the night comes and it starts raining. Water droplets consist of mud and volcanic ash. It's difficult for people to breathe without gas masks. Atmospheric pressure is constantly changing. Some people experience severe migraines and some have sore joints. But there's no time to think about your health. Humanity needs to figure out how to save itself from the collision. A new gravitational order will come when the moon crashes into Earth. Continents will change their shape. They will combine into one giant piece of land or split into a hundred smaller ones. The energy of the collision can burn all the oxygen in the atmosphere and make the planet unsuitable for life. Hiding underground also makes no sense because of deep earthquakes. People decide to spend their last hours with loved ones and their families. The moon is getting closer. It's now at the same distance as the International Space Station. The moon covers the sky. Many cities are in the shadows because of the waves. Tsunamis, several miles in height, crash down on the ground. Millions of tons of magma collide with the ocean. Billions of gallons of water just evaporate. Moisture rises into the air, mixes with ash, and floods the land in the form of giant cumulus clouds. You've accepted the complete destruction of the planet. But something strange happens to the moon at this moment. You notice giant cracks appear on it. The moon slowly begins to divide into two parts. Both halves crumble into hundreds of large pieces. It's just falling apart. The Earth doesn't have a natural satellite anymore. It's just a pile of giant space rocks. But why is this happening? There's a space around our planet called the Roche Limit. In this place, the gravity of Earth is stronger than that of the Moon. This means that the forces holding the Moon together are weaker than those that tear it apart. People are cheering. The Roche Limit has saved the planet. The Moon won't hit us. 
It breaks up into millions of fragments and forms a circle around our globe. Now, Earth looks like Saturn. A belt of moonstones surrounds us. Huge chunks destroy everything in their path. All the space debris. The satellites are no longer working. Humanity loses its means of communication and navigation. People will have to use paper maps again. The moon held our planet's orbit at a certain angle before these events. Now the axis is tilted differently. One hemisphere becomes closer to the sun, and the other plunges into shadow. The North Pole and the Arctic may turn into hot deserts, and the equator of the planet may be covered with ice. Winter and summer can last for years. The moon's remnants fly around Earth, but some of them fall on our planet. Lunar meteor showers destroy cities and create giant craters. All these events lead to the massive destruction of life on Earth. It will take hundreds of thousands of years to adapt to the new world.